Good morning. It looks like I'm the chief cook and bottle boy for everything this morning. <laughs> and, uh, Donna and Jim are out at the farm museum for the weekend. So. Well, we're glad you're here. And, and you're welcome to this morning. And a little bit of a rain.
rain shower. At least no storms, that's good. It's called the worship is. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Number 620 in your hymnal. Number in the red hymnal, 620. gathered their forces for war. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped to the valley of Elah and drew up their right line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height, six cubits, and they span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore brown screws and a bronze javelin was flung on his back. His spear cap was like a weaver rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield hair went ahead of him. 
Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him to come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and his Israelites Announcements today, the, there's, of course, the offering box, as you know, is in the foyer. Uh, CPW Wednesday at 3, and I think, is that here at the church? Yes, I think so. And there's a church work day coming up Saturday, and uh, August 7th is a week away. Yeah, it's two weeks from yesterday. Uh, any other announcements that I should be making? I think that's I think that's it. I have a little trouble with my computer, so some of this dark type is not intended, but it just happened that way. Uh, okay, let's share with him. Let's sing the next hymn, number six thirty one.
I was going to add you to the list. I'll try to remember to do that. But. Yes. My mom and Oscar need prayers. Oscar is really not doing well. Okay. Are there others? I had a good week. It was a kind of a strange one. I had on Tuesday. I had a procedure done where they had to go down in through my vein in my neck into down into the vena cava and remove a filter that was put in the day after Thanksgiving. It cut blood clots. I was awake through the whole thing and and I didn't really mind. It was kind of interesting to hear all their conversation. I they had a sheet over so I couldn't really see but I could hear everything they would say. And then he showed me the little, the little filter when he got it out. And uh, so I'm glad to have that done. I think that's the last procedure I have for a while, hopefully. But it was, uh, but he, uh, very nice. It was the same doctor who put it in. And that was the day after Thanksgiving. He thought I looked a little better today <laughs> or this week. I mean, that was in one of my low points when he put that in. Because there, there had been some blood clots and things like that. And then I saw a new doctor at VA this week, and I was happy with this new doctor, and that worked out nice and very pleasant. And uh, none of the drama I've had in the past with a couple of them. So anyway, that, that worked out well. Um, I'm trying to think what else. It seems like you what? An what? You had an yes, Wednesday. I was on my way, way to rehab. I only had two rehabs left Wednesday and Friday. And going down the Rocky Mountain Avenue, a car came out of a, of a driveway, and boom! It didn't do much damage to my car. It, you could see it out here, but you really, unless you look close, you don't notice it. Hers had knocked the whole front bumper off. And, and she was really nice, and, and it, I'm sure this, her insurance company's going to pay for it, all it looks like, which I'm glad for that. <clears throat> um, but I'm glad the way was hurt. That was the main thing. And the man who lives there <clears throat> came out, Mr. Sugg, and he said, well, both these people are good people, he told the, the sheriff's deputy. So that was nice to get a positive <laughs> statement. And so anyway, but it was, that was, so I was supposed to be at rehab at 10. I got there by 1.30. But I had to wait for a tow truck to, to haul, my, haul my van because a, a, a tire was punctured, a hole in the tire. And, these new cars, a lot of them don't even have a spare tire or a jack. And I may be able to get one. I thought, no, I got AAA. I think I'll just let them deal with it. <laughs> so anyway, so it was about 11:30 before my tow truck came. And, but I was, but he was very nice. And the problem was the lady had to be towed. She had to be towed down to Farina or somewhere. So that truck was busy. So then they had to get one from Lebanon. So it took till 11:30 for him to get there. But it was okay. The good news was I was okay, and my car is drivable. I had, a, I had to get a, new, a different tire because there was a big hole in it, but yeah, a little bit of damage, but not, not serious. So thankful for minor problems with that. And so, and I think that's all of the excitement this week. <laughs> not exactly what I expected, but anybody else? Any joys? My joy is. It wasn't any worse than it was. I had lots and lots of comments on our hymn sing last Sunday night. I got phone calls at work and at home, and people at work were talking about how good it was. And by the way, I put it on Facebook Live, so if any of you are on Facebook and, and weren't there and want to watch it, you can go to my page and watch it. I, I may try to put it on YouTube, but I'm having trouble with my internet, so I don't know if I'll be able to do that. But, but anyway, but it was, we had 60 some people. I, don't, I didn't get an accurate count, but it was, it was a nice size group anyway. And I thought people seemed to enjoy it. Thank you for that note. Anybody else? Any praise notes? So, well, then let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for answered prayers. And we thank you that you care about us and that you, our little concerns are concerns for you and you, you deal with them and thank you so much. And Father, today we, we just pray for each of the ones that are mentioned. We pray for uh, 
Karen, if she's having chemo, Lord, help her. For the people at the house fire, we don't know their names, but Lord, you know all about it. We just pray that you'll be with them. For Oscar and uh, Barbara's uh, mom, that you'd be with both of them during this time. Thank you for each of the ones who uh, are here today. Just bless them, we pray, and help them. We especially pray for Mike Wolford, continue to be with him. Thank you that Victor is doing well. We just pray for Fred Wiseman and Don Jones, for the Newmans in Lithuania, for those in hospitals or nursing homes, wherever they might be, Father. For our servicemen and women, for Jody's grandson, for our church family, for each one. And we pray for, for thank you that Tom is doing well, continue to be with Tom Hanks. And for Doc's sister-in-law. And Lord, just help us, we pray. Bless the remainder of the service. So Christ might be honored in all that we do and say. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we're going to have the offering you song. Well, this is something we added last week, so we'll, we'll, for, we'll forgive her. Too. Doesn't she do a great job? She does. Give her a hand. We can depend on her, and I'm so thankful for that. Well, we're looking at 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to mark this so I have it for later. 1 Samuel 17, and let me read a bit of that to you. It's a very familiar story. Um, and it's it's one of those stories that kids always remember, don't they? It's the story of David and Goliath. First Samuel 17, and I'm going to read a few verses, beginning with verse 34. In fact, I'm going to back up to 32. David said to Saul, "Let no one lose heart." on account of this Philistine, your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off his sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Can you imagine doing that? When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, <laughs> struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued him from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And we'll look at more of the scripture you know, as we go through the message. Called it qualities of an overcomer. What comes to mind when you think of David? Anybody just want to call out, what, what do you think of when you think of David? Anybody? Shepherd boy. Shepherd boy. King. King? A man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. Psalms, most, most of the Psalms were written by David. Harp, he played a harp. I'm not sure what the harp looked like. 
but it was some kind of string instrument. We also remember things like Bathsheba and Absalom and some of those things that are not, well, uh, there were some negative things there, but you know, was David perfect? No. Is any person perfect? No, only Jesus was perfect. But God forgave David for some of his mistakes he made. And the good news is David was following God and became a great king, didn't he? And we could name other things too. He, um, he was born in, do you know what town he was born in? Bethlehem, the same one that Jesus was born in. Remember, it's called the city of David. Yeah, that was his hometown. That's where he was born. And uh, he had a, a really good friend. What was his name? Jonathan. Jonathan, who was the son of King Saul. And that was kind of interesting because Saul hated David, but his son was his best friend. Yeah. Well, we can go on and talk more and more. But anyway, those were some of the things I'm sure you meant. Slingshot. And I thought about bringing one, but I don't think the one I had would be like the one he used. I think his was just basically straps with leather. And from what I've seen pictures, but I don't know for sure. Uh, my father-in-law had made one out of a branch, branch, uh, tree branch that was forked. And I've got that somewhere. But, uh, but I've never tried to use a slingshot. How, how many of you have ever tried to shoot something with a slingshot? Okay. Did you get anything with it? I did try to shoot it living, but I haven't given it. Shoot it toward a target or something. Okay. Yes? Did you? But you just had fun trying it out, yeah. yeah. How about you, uh, Russell? Did you ever use a slingshot? Yeah. Yeah. Were you good at it? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we really can appreciate David, can't we? That wouldn't be real easy, especially to think about how accurate he had to be to take his slingshot and actually hit salt in the exact right spot to kill him. Because, I mean, you probably, I imagine in the temple or something, but I don't know where he hit him. It had to be someplace that knocked him down. And I don't know if he died immediately because he actually went and killed him then. But it at least knocked him out so that he could deal with it. But, okay, well, I just thought it'd be good to kind of review who David was. And we're going to talk about some different aspects of, the, of this story. First of all, David um, had fidelity in doing his duty. In other words, he was faithful. And let me, let me share verses, begin verse 34 again. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck and rescued the sheep from his mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised felicity will be like one of them. Because God has defied the armies of the living God. <clears throat> the Lord who rescued me from the uh, paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from this um, Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Can you imagine saying, he's a little boy, he's a young boy. And to send him after this giant, he probably would have fear that he's going he's to be killed for sure. But he wasn't. So as a boy, he was reliable and faithful in what he did. Now, have we always been faithful as a kid? Well, I, I could probably tell you some stories, and you could probably tell me some stories of times when we might not have. I've heard stories about little boys or girls who were out planting garden, and they got tired of planting the seeds, so they dug them and put them all in one spot. Now, you know what would happen with that, don't you? When they grew, all of a sudden, all these come up with this one cluster, and the rest of the world doesn't have any plants there to take up there, you know. Um, and, but kids do things like that. And probably adults do things just as crazy sometimes. But we won't just blame kids for it. <coughs> but he was faithful in doing what he was supposed to do. When he was taking care of the sheep, he took care of the sheep. He protected them from the lion and the bear. I just can't imagine, to me, to face a lion? Forget it. I don't think I'd want to do that with you. Uh, I've never really had an opportunity to do that, and I'm thankful. I don't want that opportunity. Uh, but if we're going to be used by God, we need to be faithful in small things. You know, I remember having a friend who wanted to go to the mission field, but he wasn't doing anything here. 
do you think God's going to send the mission field if you're not doing anything now? You know, he uses people who are willing to work at whatever they're doing. David was faithful in taking care of his father's sheep. And so then, because he was faithful in that, he could be used by God. And that's important, faithfulness. Um, God doesn't usually call lazy people, but rather those who are willing to work. There's a story told of an 11th century German king, King Henry III, who having grown tired of court life and pressures of being a monarch, applied to a monastery to be accepted for a life of contemplation. You know, monasteries, you go there and you just, you just uh, read the scriptures and you pray and you don't do much else. The religious superior of the monastery, Prior Richard, is reported to have said, Your Majesty, do you understand that the pledge here is of obedience? That would be hard because you have been a king. Henry replied, I understand. The rest of my life I'll be obedient to you as Christ leads you. Then I will tell you what to do, said the Prior Richard. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has placed you. When King Henry III died, a statement was written, the king learned to rule by being obedient. That's a neat story, isn't it? King, like King Henry, we too often tire of our job. I don't like what I'm doing. I didn't like some of the chores on the farm. Any, were any of you farm kids? Yeah. You remember the chores on the farm? Yeah. I, the one I hated the most was taking care of the chickens. I hated the chickens. And mom said they were her chickens, but I'm the one who got to take care of them. And I didn't like the old hens because they were broody and they wouldn't want to get off the nest so I get the eggs and I'd try to get the eggs out from under them and they'd peck me. And the rooster I really hated and I'd carry a stick and the more I beat on him, the more he tried to attack me, you know. If you know anything about roosters, they can be kind of a pain in the neck. Well, anyway, but I did what mom told me to do, and I took care of the chickens and gathered the eggs, and, but I, I don't have any chickens today. Now, I did have chickens in Michigan. I think you knew that story. Did I tell you that story? That was, we, we got, we decided to, they offered you to get 25 free chicks if you bought one bag of chick, chick starter. So I thought, oh, well, that's good. We had a little property there, so we did that. So we did that and we fed it to them and it worked fine. By the way, don't feed chick starter to ducks, baby ducks. It caused them to be deformed. There was some too high protein or something, I don't know what it was. But anyway, we because one of the ducks really got all deformed and it wasn't that. But anyway, back to the chicken story. So we fed the chickens, we, it came time to dress them, to uh, prepare them to eat and I had never killed a chicken, but I had watched my parents both kill them. My mother would put her foot on the head of the chicken and pull on the legs and it would come off under her foot. I knew other people would take the, the head in the hand and swing it around like this and they'd end up with the head in their hand. That was kind of gross to me. And dad always took uh, and laid the chicken over a stump with maybe a couple nails between each side of the deck and cut off with an axe. Well, that's what I was going to do. Did I tell you this story before? Probably. So here it is, the chicken's laying on the stump and I'm trying to cut its head off. And my, please have a sharp ax if you're going to do that. Mine was dull and it only cut the neck about halfway through and its eyes were rolling around and I could not finish the job. Guess who did? Norma did. And she was a good woman. She was raised on a farm too in Wisconsin. She killed chickens before. So, and my son is standing there saying, he can't do it, he can't do it. <laughs> and he was probably about five years old, or maybe four. And, well, anyway, Norman got the job done, and guess who killed all the rest of the chickens? Norman did. I, I was done. Well, that's kind of off the subject, but I thought you might want to hear that this morning. Uh, so if, you, if you're going to kill chickens, please have a sharp ax. <coughs> So, faithfulness. Faithfulness is an important trait, isn't it? He was already faithful in doing what he was supposed to do as a kid. 
And God uses faithful people. Um, a, there's a Persian lesson about a certain king needed a faithful servant and had to choose between two candidates for the office. He took both at fixed wages and told him to fill a basket with water from a nearby well, saying that he would come in the evening to inspect their work. After dumping one or two buckets of water into the basket, one of the men said, what's the good of doing this useless work? As soon as we pour the water in, it runs out the sides. Kind of reminds me of the military where we transplanted weeds. The other answered, but we have our wages, haven't we? The use, is, the use is the master's business, not ours. I'm not going to do this, such fool's work, replied the complainer. Throwing down his bucket, he went away. The other man continued until he had drained the well. Looking down into it, he saw something shiny at the bottom. It was a diamond ring. Now I see the use of pouring water into the basket, he explained. If the bucket had been brought up, if it had been brought up the ring before the well was dry, it would, have, it would have been found in the basket. Our work was not useless. They were getting rid of the water so they could come to the ring. Sometimes our work looks like useless. Do you ever feel that way? Like maybe what you're doing? And sometimes, we, maybe even in the kingdom, you know, what am I doing? I'm in this small church. Is it really significant? Well, God thinks it is. And that's not my job to judge it, is it? And maybe there's one person who's helped. Who knows? It's not my job to count how many are helped. It's my job to be faithful. So that first thing had to do with faithfulness in doing his duty. Secondly, fervor in defending God's honor. He says to King Saul, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the, law, of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. How would you feel if you were Saul at that point? I, I feel really kind of bad sending this little boy out to face that guy. He's not going to make it, but nobody else wants to go. Well, so how would you describe David in the situation? He's courageous. He's fearless. He's willing to risk his own life to protect the sheep, and in this case, to defend his country against the enemy. And God's looking for faithful people, isn't he? Courageous people who are willing to defend his honor. That brings me to the next thought. Faith in declaring God's power. Faith born in secret communion with God. He had been out with his sheep in the wilderness, wherever they were uh, taking care of sheep. And if you know anything about being a shepherd, there are a lot of really lonely times. I think I would have trouble with that. I remember being out on the tractor, and that was lonely. Riding the tractor all day, so he's been on a farm. What I'm talking about the old John Deere hearing the put 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 as I, as I, especially cultivating corn was my least favorite thing to do because it put me to sleep. Just watching those rows, and it was a, it was only a four row cultivator, you know, not up like that. They don't use cultivators anymore, but anyway, and you you you're driving that, and it just hypnotizes you as you go down those rows. You know what? If you can picture that. And I used to hate, that was probably one of the things I hated most about being on the farm was clothing. I didn't mind plowing so much or bailing hay or some of the other things, but that driving the tractor with those rows of corn coming through was really hard. You know? Well, anyway, but the good news is I did it. I did plow up some corn some and Dad said, what happened out here, you know? When you're plowing out four rows at once if you have to fall asleep. Uh, I said, well, wouldn't that make a good watermelon last? <laughs> I don't think Dad was laughing, but anyway. Well, David said to the Philistine, um, 
By the way, I mean, let me back up and see what the Philistine said to David. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by the gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord serves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Interesting, isn't it? He was willing to step out in faith. There was a party aboard a ship in full swing. Speeches were being made by the captain, the crew, and the guests enjoying the week-long voyage. Sitting at the head table was a 70-year-old man who was somewhat embarrassed, was doing his best to accept praise being poured on him. Earlier that morning, a young woman had apparently fallen overboard, and within seconds, this elderly gentleman was in the cold, dark waters at her side. The woman was rescued, and the elderly man became an instant hero. When time finally came for the brave passenger to speak, the state room fell into a hush as he rose from his chair. He went to the microphone, and what was probably the shortest hero speech ever offered spoke these stirring words. I just want to know who pushed me. <laughs> He wasn't even planning on doing it. <laughs> but he, he did it, didn't he? <laughs> That's all that got. Well, I like this poem someone has written. God give us men. A time like this demands strong minds, great hearts, true faith, great steady hands. Men and women whom the lust for office does not kill. Men and women whom the spoils of office cannot buy, men and women who possess opinions and will, men and women who have honor, men and women who will not lie, men and women can stand before a synagogue. That's good, isn't it? We need those kind of people. That's what we need in our government today. We need those kind of people. In our state, in our nation, local government, we need people who stand up for what's right. Well, so faith in declaring God's power, he said, God will take care of it. And so, finally, frankness in discarding man's weapons. Well, this isn't the final one, but it's the fourth one. It's interesting. Here's David, a young shepherd boy, and they're going to put on him this heavy armor like Saul had on. So he's trying to put it on, but it's kind of humorous, really. And it, it's too big. It just doesn't fit. <coughs> it's too big for David, but it's too small for Goliath. So what are David's weapons? No, it's not his armor. It's not a javelin. It's a simple shepherd's crook that later becomes a royal scepter. A common sling that was probably just a blue piece of rope or, or leather, maybe. Probably made out of leather. A tuneful harp, I don't think he was playing it when he was facing Goliath, but he did play it for King Saul when Saul was troubled, and it would actually soothe Saul and calm him down. And he wrote a whole book of praise psalms, the book of Psalms, 150 of them. Five smooth stones. And someone had said they were, they were for each of the five lords of the Philistines. I think he only used one. I think he only took one. He had to be a good shot. What if he had missed on that first time? Then probably the life would have come after him. You know, I thought about that, what, what I went through this last few, few months, you know. What if my cardiologist, when I first went to, to uh, the hospital at Anderson Hospital, but said after about six or seven times, well, I don't think it's going to be really good with this stuff. Fortunately, he went nine plus. We don't know how many times. 
it was at least nine, they lost track that he resuscitated me. I'm thankful that he kept going because he could have stopped. Maybe, the, maybe God was speaking to him and saying, keep going, keep going. I don't think I was out very long any of those times because somebody asked me if I saw any white lights or anything and I didn't. So I hope that's not a bad sign. I, I think it probably just means I wasn't there long enough, <laughs> momentarily. Well, so here we have this. So in the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and many other things he did after that as when he became king. So then the final one this morning is fearlessness in delivering God's people. David ran and stood over Goliath, whom he had knocked down. I don't, he had knocked him out. I'm not sure that he was dead at this point. But Goliath was on the ground and was incapable of attacking him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Now, I can't imagine doing this. Can you imagine? How many of you think you could cut off somebody's head? I hope you never want to, you know. I mean, is there a bone in there? I don't know. But he did. He cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines at the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. The dead were strewn along the, uh, the way to Gath and the Ekron. When the Israel, uh, Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Opportunity. Remember, three things come not back. The arrow sent in its track, upon its track. It will not swerve, it will not stay. Its speed, it flies to wound or slay. The spoken word so soon forgot by thee, but it has perished not. In other hearts it is living still and doing work for good or ill. And a lost opportunity that cometh back no more to thee. In vain thou weepest, in vain that dost yearn. These three shall never more return. And then somebody wrote this particular poem, and I thought it was good. I prayed for help, I prayed for strength, I prayed for victory, I prayed for patience and for love, for true humility. But as I prayed my dying Christ, by faith I seemed to see. And as I gazed, my heart, glad heart cried, all things are mine. Through thee. If he doth dwell within my heart, why need I strength implore? The giver of all grace is mine, and shall I ask for more? The need I pray for victory, when he who conquered death dwells in my inmost soul, nearer indeed than breath. Oh, help me, Lord, to realize that thou art all I am all, that I am more than conqueror in great things and in small. No need of I, but thou hast met upon the cruel tree. O precious dying risen Lord, thou art my victory. Ava Christensen wrote that in one of Swindoll's books. Well, this morning, I don't think anyone's really called to kill the lives or giants, but we have been called to serve the Lord. And we just have to do what we're called to do. David was called for a special task, and not many would ever have a similar task to do. But we are called to do something. It may seem like a small thing. Maybe it seems like it's not worth much at all. Maybe you say, why am I doing this? I remember in the military, we were asked to transplant weeds. Now, I knew there were weeds, and we took them and they were over here, and we moved them over to over here. But what if I had said no? I've been in trouble. So I just faithfully had to do what I was asked to do. And it was transplant these weeds over here. And probably the next day we were going to transplant them back. But you learn to be faithful and obedient. And that's all that God asks for us today is, you know, he's not having us transplant weeds, but he wants us to be faithful. And whatever little thing we're called to do, <clears throat> they say, well, what I'm doing is not very significant. 
doesn't seem significant sometimes. But in God's eyes, it may be very significant. It's maybe, maybe you're the only person who has an influence on somebody. So we're called to do whatever God calls us to do and do it faithfully, and he'll be with us one day. David had a big job to do, and he did it well. And it said that he was a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? No. David had adultery. David did several things that were not appropriate, but he was willing to confess them to God and get his life straightened around. And that's all God asks, that we're willing to do that. We're going to sing in closing, number 619. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Let's stand.